Thanks for coming to the breakout session on telemedicine uh, for people with IDD. My name is Matt Kaufman. Uh, I am an ER doctor. Um, uh, I've started a telemedicine group uh, with other ER doctors that focuses on the population with IDD. I'm going to talk a little about what I think is the need for this type of technology or application of technology and our successes uh, that we've had that we're very excited about. That said, I'm a very untechnical person, and if I screw this part up, that's embarrassing. Uh, so just to give you some background, just really basic facts about the population with IDD and the ER. I mean, that's what we're focused on at this point, uh, even though many ER visits, as we know, are not typically uh, so dramatic when we think of ER visits. They're not always heart attacks. They're not always gunshots. Uh, it's certainly used uh, for uh, medical reasons that go uh, well beyond uh, any trauma or, or very, very serious injuries. Uh, it, it's used for infections, simple stuff like infections, rashes, and so forth. Um, and particularly in this population with IDD, uh, we see actually an increased utilization compared to the rest of the population. And, and the reasons, reasons for that, I think, are multifactorial. But there's some data on this that uh, really there's, there's a much greater use of the ER uh, with this population than, than other people. And actually, when you talk about very common uh, infectious causes like a UTI or a pneumonia, which could probably be treated um, in most cases from a primary care uh, provider, the case is almost five times in some data uh, sets that shows this. So, and once they get to the ER, what happens? Uh, well, there's a lot of times where a patient is hospitalized when they're seen in the ER, and that is also, uh, I'll talk, I'll speak to what I think the reasons for this are as well, and, and a lot of times uh, the reasons that they're hospitalized, most commonly due to seizures, pneumonia, uh, infections, uh, GI uh, issues, and mental illness. Um, and that's a data set specific to the population of people with IDD. Uh, and then what happens once the people with IDD get into the hospital? Well, there's a lot of data showing that there's actual increased complications of hospitalizations, increased uh, hospital-acquired infections, uh, increased trauma, falls, and so forth. So really, every step of the way, what we're seeing is this is a pretty bad experience. Uh, and then readmissions. Uh, this is, if you ever, if you touch on the healthcare system at all, uh, that relates to the hospital at this point, readmissions uh, play a huge role in, in the assessment of data. And it is determined by CMS and, uh, and other uh, regulatory entities as really a failure in the system if someone gets readmitted within 30 days. And there's a big, you know, taking a step back from the human aspect and looking at the financial aspect, it takes a huge toll in the healthcare system in terms of dollars. Hospitals lose a ton of money by readmissions, and so do the facilities and residential facilities that are taking care of them. So there, this problem, this issue has been recognized uh, that within the population of people with IDD, uh, you know, hospital use, ER use is a problem. Uh, there are certain efforts, uh, you know, relatively small efforts um, to reduce this problem. Uh, Patient-centered medical homes, uh, there's a paper that shows somewhere around a 25% decrease um, in, in some high-risk populations. Uh, this is a pretty small paper, um, although I think that's a pretty significant dent, and I think there's uh, a lot of good that comes out of those programs. Uh, telemedicine is a tool that I think really uh, offers a even better solution to ER, to decreasing ER utilizations, hospitalizations, and trauma for population of people with IDD and other disabilities. Uh, we have some data that I'll show you. The Station MD is my group. Uh, and we're very proud of this data that I'll show you, which shows an actual 86% reduction in ER use in, in uh, one of our pilot uh, studies. So what makes it all happen? Why is all this a problem? 
Uh, well, it, why, why do people with IDD get transferred to the ED, to the ER? I call it the ED. That's the sort of emergency medicine term. Uh, so first of all, there's, the, the population is high risk. There's a lot of potential medical complications. There's increased infections, respiratory issues, uh, GI issues. I mean, this is, you know, there are real medical problems uh, that many folks face that is not typical for the rest of the population. Um, so it's real. But there's also defensive medicines. The doc on the other side is nervous. If you get a call at night and you say you're hearing from the staff member and, and uh, if, it's, if it's from a residential facility and you, the doctor is, is saying, listen, I don't know what's going on. You better get them evaluated by the ER. I don't want to get sued. That's real too. Uh, especially, I, I'm uh, in New York, New Jersey based, uh, although telemedicine, we're working around the country, uh, but where I trained and learned to practice was New York and New Jersey, and boy, uh, we worry about liability a lot. Um, and then there's regulatory requirements. Every state has their certain regulations. If there's not some, uh, a patient that's evaluated after a certain finding within a certain period of time, there's major fines, there's major uh, citations uh, that are dealt with. So this is, you know, this is real too. Uh, and, and for this population, uh, really the traditional method of saying, hey, I have a problem. Uh, I'm going to give the doc on call uh, you know, a call to see if we can, you know, figure it out. Well, in many cases, the person is nonverbal, can't explain wh what's, what they're feeling or if they're in pain. Uh, a lot of times you're taking, you're, it's requiring visual cues and nonverbal cues. Um, and it really is inadequate. It's not an adequate uh, assessment. And the doctor on the other end, he or she says, listen, to be safe, I'm going to transfer that patient to the ER. And that's real, that's real life. Uh, I'll just take a quick example. I'm going to run through this because I want to get to the data. But something that, that maybe many of you seen have seen is a, you know, taking, this is a real case actually, uh, of a 24-year-old man uh, in a facility, residential facility, uh, with cerebral palsy, uh, develops a cough and a fever. Saturday, doctor can't be reached, no surprise, playing golf or something, uh, although I don't go, I'm a terrible golfer. Uh, and uh, the staff is concerned transfer to the ER, uh, notify the parent, the mother in this case, who says, okay, I'll, I'll go meet you at the ER, um, see what's going on. Uh, they get there at 515, doctor whizzes by, says, all right, I'm going to order a blood test and an x-ray, see you later. Uh, the, the man's mother uh, meets in the ER, waits in a chair. The, the ER staff, if you're lucky, will be nice enough to give a chair so that the parent or caregiver or loved one can sit next to them. Sometimes they're standing. It's I, not to bash ERs. I, I, you know, I grew up in an ER, but it can be a rough place. Uh, what, what is the person with IDD experiencing? Well, for anybody, an ER can be very frightening. Uh, for a person with sensory issues and IDD, it can be particularly terrifying. Uh, in many of them, there are trauma centers, there's people bleeding, there's people screaming, there's people on drugs. I mean, there can be real terrifying stuff. Um, and there's trauma, trauma of transportation itself. If you're taking someone out of their residential facility, their home setting, and transporting, there's risks right there. Uh, infections. Um, and then there's really something that I think people don't talk about a lot, which is just general disruption of routine. Uh, that includes missed medications, missed meals at certain times. Uh, if the patient gets a peg feed, they're, they're, they're not accessible in the ER immediately. So there's, it, it's a mountain of problems that's just generated just by that ER visit without anything else happening. Forget about the issue. Forget about anything else. Just the ER visit itself causes a major disruption and some major potential problems. So back to the ER, the mother, meanwhile, knows everything that's going on, knows that the her son is due for his seizure medicine at 6 p.m. sharp, uh, knows all the details of medical history, says, Doc, do me a favor, he's missing his Keppra at 6 p.m., he's going to have a seizure if he doesn't get it. Well, the doctor's a nice guy, it might even be me. Uh, and he says, okay, let me get the Keppra. I talk to the pharmacist, get Keppra over here. Well, Doc, we have to get it from the pharmacy, we have to wait for them to send it up. Uh, congratulations, it's three hours later, we don't have the Keppra the man has a seizure on top of his, 
his fever and uh, cough. So from the ER doctor perspective, look, we're running around. It's chaotic. We're, we have, we're typically looking at a scribble on a piece of paper uh, from the caregiver or facility staff, and we're making decisions based on very little information. Uh, we do a battery of tests. Most of the time, we just end up admitting if it's at all complicated. Some, sometimes not, but many, many times, particularly if there's any complication, if you're not certain that the patient is going to have good follow-up or uh, if there's any question about what kind of uh, ability the, the staff or the, at home the patient will have in terms of getting medications, the default is to admit. And we, are, we already talked about what happens when patients are admitted. They have increased complications and a whole cascade of problems. So uh, the outcome in this case, the doctor says, oh, well, look, now you have a seizure. You had a seizure. Uh, I had to give Ativan. Uh, the patient's not at his baseline mental status. He's got a fever. Uh, probably a bronchitis. I'm going to admit him. Ends up staying for four days. That four days takes a toll. So and what's happening on the residential facility um, there are staffing issues. I mean, it's a disruption all across the board. Staffing issues, they're short-staffed uh, at the facility. Um, I know this because I've, you know, when we're working with staff members, we hear the hardship on their end. They say, oh, we, now we don't have enough staff to cover our, our uh, consumers on this end. Uh, and anyway, and, this, and less importantly, there's overtime payments and the, the facility loses money. Uh, in some cases, they're actually paying for transportation as well. So getting on to the solution, that's the problem. I think you, you guys probably know the problem very well, depending on what settings you're working in. Um, we had a pilot uh, that was funded by Medicaid. And since we've had the good fortune of uh, being able to expand our services uh, much broader, but, but this is a pilot uh, which was 17 weeks, the data was 17 weeks, two facilities, 15 patients per facility, and we showed an 86% reduction in ER use we only covered off hours. So it was very limited coverage and we still made a very big impact. The process is very simple. I just want to run through it, not because it's fancy, but actually for the opposite reason, because it's very simple. Um, so the process is there's an identification of a change in condition. Uh, the caregiver, the patient, the parent, uh, staff activates our system. I, in this case, Station MD. It doesn't have to be Station MD, uh, but that's my group, so that's, we, know how to, we know how our system works. There are other systems. Uh, we do a, a physician assessment. Uh, we are in, in our case, we make sure that we have actual access to patient medical records, so we're not like a, a group that just is floating out there in the ether that just swoops in. We actually are on staff. We're credentialed. Uh, we know these patients, uh, so we can look. Oh, he has a seizure once every... Uh, two months, typically, this is a very big change from baseline. We can see that. Uh, we can make adjustments based on that. It's not swooping in, swooping out. Um, and we document also. I'll talk a little about that. So we perform an assessment. Uh, we implement a treatment plan. It may be, depending on the setting, we may have to call in a prescription to a local pharmacy. Uh, there, there may be uh, some other uh, treatment indicated. Uh, in, in many cases, I've actually given you know, just supervised pulmonary toileting from the staff, uh, increasing the, the phlegm uh, expectoration, and that's improved the oxygen saturation dramatically. Things like that make a huge difference. And we have time, as opposed to the ER, when we're making our assessment, we have time to sit with the staff who knows the patient the best and in the setting where the patient is used to and, and solve these problems, work on these problems. So let's talk about how that's done. Uh, it's really simple. We get a call, we review the electronic medical record, which we have access to. Um, there's one click. I mean, again, it's very simple stuff. Uh, the provider is seeing the patient on the other end. Uh, the provider is, by the way, not out playing golf. The provider is, they're dedicated to this work. Uh, they're on shift. We're ER doctors. We consider ourselves on shift. We're not taking care of our kids. We are there for this job and nothing else during our time on call. Uh, the doctor can see the patient, the patient can see the doctor, and likewise the caregiver. Uh, we direct the caregiver, whoever it is, to whether it's a, a staff, a family member, uh, a nurse, 
uh, depending on the setting, we, we engage that person, that intermediary in many cases, to sort of be our assistant. We go through an exam, say, do this, let's check this out, and engages that person, engages that staff member, and in some cases directly to the patient his, himself or herself, depending on their capabilities. Uh, sometimes it's a direct conversation, uh, a direct uh, instruction. Um, but many times there's an intermediary, and we can make a, a very detailed assessment uh, and as we heard in our morning session, in my opinion, that detailed assessment, even though it's, it's not, uh, we're not in the same room, it's actually superior to what we're doing in the ER when we're right there. Uh, so we give, there's actually a stethoscope uh, that we have that we're able to transmit so sounds, uh, breath sounds and heart sounds to us through the computer. That's about as fancy as we get. Uh, again, I think that um, we want to keep it simple. Our, our costs of, of the hardware are very low because we think that really it's the application of this talk technology rather than a robot who can do everything for 50 grand. Um, so we conduct the exam. Uh, we can also um, actually conference in a family member or another caregiver so that everybody can be involved in an evaluation. And that goes a long way as well to I think giving comfort to caregivers and family members and, and alleviating concerns. So let's take a look at some of our data. Uh, this was from the pilot. Uh, it's about seven or eight months uh, of data here. The, the blue lines, the total lines represent the, all of the calls. The orange represent those patients that we ended up transferring to the emergency departments anyway. We said, listen, in this case, you need to transfer the patient to the ER. Uh, the blue lines represent all of the cases that we were able to handle in-house. So you can see, uh, there's a lot more blue than orange. I'll talk about that. Uh, so this is month by month from uh, March to uh, November 2017. And this is just taking a look at the uh, diagnosis and the outcome. Um, so the the why we got calls and so forth. The by far the most common cause was infection uh, issues. It's almost it's almost like a if I, I'm embarrassed to say it's almost like a middle finger up there that's saying hey you, you, we have to call you for this uh, and it's there's it's just a constant uh, issue that, that that can be addressed in many cases at home even in infectious issues. Uh, vast majority of the time, uh, we, um, we are able to handle the issue at home. Um, the other issues that you may or may not be familiar with that happens very commonly are constipation or GI issues, eye complaints, pink eye, and so forth, uh, minor traumas that are falls that need to be evaluated, minor skin tears. Uh, many cases, we can handle this in the facility itself or at home. Uh, and breaking that down just to the infectious, uh, what infection diagnosis, cellulitis, uh, fevers that we are not otherwise uh, specific, gastroenteritis, and pneumonias. Uh, most of these cases we're able to take care of at home. Sepsis, frank sepsis, we send to the ER, of course. In terms of cost savings, again, I'm a big believer that forgetting, putting aside all of the financial benefits this is really, in my opinion, the best work I've ever done. Uh, we have helped more people with this very simple technology than I have in the rest of my ER career. Uh, and that's the most important thing for us. But it also happens to save a lot of money. And we're also very proud of that because that's the real world that we need to uh, you know, work with in order to get these services uh, paid for. And f if you look on the left here, I'm not going to get into all these different uh, numbers here, but uh, looking, this is actually data from not all eight months, but from three months. And it shows uh, that of the number of patients that we saw, um, we saved transfers in 20 of those patients, and we estimated actually, I'm sorry, yeah, we, and we estimate of those 20, 13, we just avoided the ER transfer, but seven would have been admitted to the hospital based on their uh, diagnosis and condition. Based on those numbers, assuming those are correct, um, we saved the facility itself, just the residential facility, about 25 grand. This is 30 patients, that's all. 30 patients weekend coverage. 
and, and uh, yeah, from Friday to Monday. Uh, we saved about 25 grand for the facility uh, in terms of loss of revenue from bed and loss of revenue from staff overtime and sometimes in transportation. The payer who would have to pay for the hospitalization and the ER visit, uh, almost $150,000. I'm sorry, 118,000. You total them up, it's almost $150,000. So there's major cost savings here, not just improvement of care, uh, not just more specialized docs addressing the patients, uh, but we're talking about major, major uh, cost savings. Uh, again, in my opinion, you can't just throw every doc into this uh, field. Uh, you need to make sure that that person is trained specifically uh, for the conditions that people with IDD face. Um, and we have protocols that are evidence-based um, that we utilize that are guides for our physicians. Of course, every patient is different, and it's not a one-size-fit-all, but we uh, really closely evaluate when there are deviations from this to see why and to make sure it's, at, it's uh, acceptable. Um, and like I said, our doctors are carefully vetted, carefully trained, um, and we're credentialed at the facility. We're not kind of swooping in from nowhere and doing this work. We're uh, you know, we are a team of docs that gets credentialed and works as a team with the facility or with the home. We document uh, if there is an EHR at the facility that the facility uses, we document directly into that. Uh, if the primary care doctor uh, has his or her own uh, EHR, we use that. Um, we have a, we, we tailor a system to communicate with the primary care phys, uh, physician or provider to make sure they're looped into what's going on and if there's follow-up needed. Uh, it's really not, you know, in terms of setting this up, uh, whether it's us or some other group that does this, it's, it's not a major, it should not be a major thing. It should take a couple of months, two or three months, depending on the doctor's licensing and so forth. Again, this can be done anywhere in the country from anywhere. Uh, so it really, there's no geographic limitation here. Uh, you need Wi-Fi. You need the docs, uh, you need the hardware. It's very easy to do. Uh, it, you re need real buy-in from the home or the facility. Uh, you need to get, the pay we need to get credentialed at the facility. Um, that usually takes some time. Uh, and there's training of the staff or the patient or the, the family. So uh, how does it get paid? This is a big issue because telemedicine for many years uh, has really been um, something that I think potentially uh, that the potential of which has been held back just by, by virtue of reimbursement problems. Uh, and that, that continues to be the case in many circumstances. Uh, we've, you know, we've, I think that a lot of that reimbursement problem has been solved or is in the process of being solved. Uh, we have, we use uh, subscription models, payers directly and a combination and also grant work. Um, we uh, take data very seriously. We give data reports. Why are you getting calls? Um, what are the problems? Can we uh, work on preventing problems before they happen? If there are falls at a certain uh, time of day, we alert the facility or residential facility or uh, try to uh, you know, create prevention plans as well and trend issues. Um, we do chart reviews. And we also do education for nursing or direct care staff facility to better utilize our system and also just better take care of uh, the consumers or patients there. Uh, and we have physician education as well.